Dr. Harsha Disanayaka, who is a senior registrar in endocrinology uh, of the National Hospital of uh, uh, Sri Lanka, who will speak on shifting paradigm in diabetes care, control, remission and cure. Over to you, Dr. Harsha. Good afternoon to all of you and thank you, Chairperson, sir. Let me also thank the Ceylon College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity. So what I intend to do in the coming 20 to 25 minutes is to sensitize you towards an emerging paradigm or a new concept in the management of diabetes. Let me begin by reminding ourselves about a common day-to-day -day scenario that we all have encountered. A 40-year-old man is newly diagnosed to have diabetes. He comes to you with increased HbA1c and fasting plasma glucose. He's asymptomatic and the history is otherwise unremarkable. He is obese by our standards and also has a high normal blood pressure. My question is, what am I going to tell this patient? What, are, what will you tell this patient? Should we say that you have diabetes and you're going to live with that for the rest of your life? Should I suggest that let's try dietary and lifestyle modifications first before starting pharmacological agents? Or should we directly offer him antidiabetic drugs? Or should I start with uh, insulin to begin with? I'm sure you would have your own answers for this, maybe based on current guidelines. Let us keep that in the back of our mind and move forward. In the first part of my talk, what I would do is to recapitulate how the understanding of pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes has evolved over time and how that has changed or shaped the way we manage it. And then I'll focus on some data about the shift in paradigm trying to remit or cure diabetes and finally discuss whether this is a realistic goal. Our understanding and our knowledge on type 2 diabetes and its natural history is largely shaped or molded by what the UK PDS trial taught us. In people with type 2 diabetes, there is a gradual, progressive, irreversible, and inexorable decline in beta cell function, and this is probably due to beta cell death, is what it taught. There have been many explanations why this happens, why the hyperglycemia occurs, and this was led by uh, the triumvirate concept proposed by DiFronzo, where the key highlights were insulin hyposecretion and increased insulin resistance in the liver and peripheral tissue. Over the next two or three decades, this has expanded into ominous octet and further into egregious 11 and dirty dozen and all that, and that has also been the focus upon which the ter therapeutic targets and therapeutic agents have been developed. And this has also molded the way we, the targets we keep in treating diabetes, whether it is glucocentric approach about several decades ago into cardiovascular risk reduction. And finally, nowadays the focus on cardiorenal centric approach where antidiabetic agents with cardiorenal benefits beyond its glucose lowering efficacy are given priority. But underlying all this, there's one fundamental agreement or consensus within our minds. And that is that the beta cells will continue to die. The disease will continue to progress. What we do is react to that. We'll try to replace whatever the deficient insulin action. And we'll also try to mitigate the complications that arise as a result. Is this the best way to handle diabetes? A different angle to the question or a different perspective was first explored by a group of researchers as long as three and a half decades ago from to today where they studied 10 individuals who had type 2 diabetes who had failed to control on sulfonylurea therapy and they put them on intensive insulin therapy for three months and what they observed was interestingly the insulin requirement declined by nearly 40 percent and more than that about half of the participants managed to come out of all antidiabetic therapies and remained in a possible remission for at least three months. This was the first evidence to say that beta cells are non-functional, but not all of them are dead. They are in a recoverable state. These findings were replicated in several other small-scale studies using intensive insulin treatment strategies, and they showed that the beta cell function can be increased by about 13% and 
even the insulin sensitivity can be improved by about 40-43%. And looking at those studies, at three months from the intervention, about 60 to 70% would achieve remission of diabetes. And at one year, about 40 to 50% will still remain in remission. What all this data tells us is that hyperglycemia itself will suppress the beta cell function, the so-called glucotoxicity. Is it the only factor that keeps beta cells in a suppressed state? In another interesting in vitro experiment, where beta cells were incubated with fatty acids, these researchers showed that when the beta cells take up fatty acids and store at triglycerides, along with the rise in triglycerides, their insulin secretory capacity would also decline. And interestingly, when it is reversed, when the uh, fat from the beta cells are removed, they will regain the insulin secretory capacity. So, not all the non-functioning beta cells are dead and gone. Some are in a reversible state of non-function or dysfunction. And this is principally mediated by glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity, and it is reversible. How about insulin resistance? There is ample data to say that when the liver accumulates fat, it's insulin sensitivity declines. And the key determinant is the intrahepatic or intrahepatic diacylglycerol concentration, which is a metabolite of triacylglycerol. Is the reverse true? If we remove the fat, will it restore the insulin sensitivity? Of course, this was shown in this study where they studied about 12 individuals who had diabetes, offered them a very calorie-restricted diet, and they showed that after the intervention, their insulin sensitivity will increase close to non-diabetic controls, and their liver fat content will decrease close to non-diabetic controls. Based on all this data and information, a twin cycle hypothesis was proposed to explain the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Let me take you through this. So most studies have shown that despite the aggressive control strategies, the muscle insulin resistance is very difficult to get down. Perhaps it's genetically determined. Now, in a genetically predisposed individual, if he is exposed to excessive positive energy balance over a long time, this will accumulate in the liver as fat, and that will also increase the lipogenesis within the hepatocytes, which also means that liver will export more fat out of it to other ectopic sites. And islet cells is one such site where they accumulate fat, and this will lead to de-differentiation of beta cells. This in turn will result in reduced insulin response, particularly to a glucose load taken orally, and this will raise the postprandial blood glucose. When this happens, the rest of the functioning beta cells will try to compensate by increasing its basal insulin secretion. Now, this high basal insulin secretion will further promote the adipogenesis or fat synthesis within the liver, pushing it into a vicious cycle. And the rising glucose will impart glucotoxicity and further de-differentiate the beta cells, driving another vicious cycle in the pancreatic beta cells. So these two vicious cycles will operate in tandem and will grind forward until such stage where beta cells are non-functional enough to cause overt hypoglycemia where we diagnose diabetes. Now, why does beta cells de-differentiate in the face of metabolic stress? What is thought is that what is shown in orange is a differentiated beta cell that is producing insulin. They fare poorly when they are faced with metabolic stress compared to its precursors or alpha cells. So in the face of metabolic stress, that is glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity, these beta cells will de-differentiate into a precursor beta cell which is not secreting insulin. Or it might or even de-differentiate into an alpha cell which is less susceptible to uh, metabolic stress. Now, over years, if the metabolic stress continues, these cells will eventually undergo apoptosis and will not be recoverable. In the de-differentiated stage, if we can re-differentiate them, that is where the hope for remission or cure of diabetes exists. Removing glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity on liver and pancreas can restore beta cell dysfunction. The obvious next question is, can pharmacotherapy do this? 
th therapeutic agents do this? Can they reactivate uh, the non-functional beta cells? This was studied recently in the RISE consortium where they offered different potent glucose lowering strategies like collagen, insulin, metformin, liraglutide in different combinations. They treated for one year and then took off treatment for three months and tried to see what happened. Importantly or interestingly, the BMI declined, the HbA1c declined, even came into non-diabetic range in some, but soon after it was discontinued, they rapidly returned to where they started. Same was observed for beta cell function. It soon returned to what, was, what it was in the baseline once the treatment was discontinued. Currently, existing pharmacotherapies can improve beta cell function, but effects would last only as long as the treatment is continued. We need a better solution. This is where bariatric surgery and the data from multiple cohort studies as well as randomized control trials come in, where there is an encouraging number. It's 60% of individuals with type 2 diabetes who undergo bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery will achieve remission of diabetes. Is that the answer for the question? Obviously, we know for multiple reasons this is not something practical or feasible. And these are those reasons. But if we closely look at what really happens after bariatric surgery, it is, I would imagine, I would have imagined that they lose weight so their insulin resistance would go down and that's how they would remit diabetes. But if we actually look at the metabolic parameters, this is time after bariatric surgery. And you can see that within a week, the glucose, fasting blood glucose will normalize. Within a week, the hyperinsulinemia will start to come down. And within a week, the insulin sensitivity virtually normalizes and then stabilizes. Mind you, this is far before any meaningful weight loss is achieved. So what it all says is that bariatric surgery can effectively achieve remission. And probably the mechanism, the key mechanism is acute calorie restriction. Because after a surgery, uh, uh, the patient would receive about 600, 700, 800 calories a day. And this is thought to be the reason why uh, such a fast remission of diabetes can be achieved. Can we replicate this uh, in, in non-bariatric surgery settings? That is where the counterpoint study becomes um, uh, important to appreciate. This uh, study uh, examined the effect of hypocaloric diet of about 600 to 700 kilocalories a day in 11 participants, and they showed the findings very similar to what the bariatric surgery showed. Within a week, fasting blood glucose normalizes, hepatic glucose output reduces, and the hepatic fat content reduces all in parallel. They also looked at the beta cell function. The first graph on your left shows the normal controls beta cell response where there is a first phase and then a delayed second phase of beta cell response. In diabetic individuals, the first phase, phase is totally blunted, so totally absent, and the second phase is blunted. And when they go through a calorie-restricted diet, the first phase insulin response is restored and the second phase is amplified. And importantly, the return of first phase of insulin response closely paralleled the reduction in pancreatic fat content. What all this tells us is that an acute energy deficit will reduce liver fat, will increase the hepatic insulin sensitivity, and reduce the fasting plasma glucose. And at the same time, it will also remove the pancreatic fat accumulation and will restore the biphasic insulin response, thereby leading to remission of diabetes. So without surgery, can we achieve this by lifestyle interventions? Look Ahead was a large study that was primarily designed to study the effect of intensive lifestyle intervention with a calorie restriction to 1,200 to 1,800 a day, about 5,000 individuals. They wanted to study its effect on cardiovascular outcomes. The study was negative for its primary outcome over a five-year follow-up. However, interestingly, they showed that at one year, with the intensive lifestyle modification, about 12% achieved diabetes remission. And even at four years, close to 8% remained in diabetes remission. Well, there was an argument that this might have been due to inadequate calorie restriction. And then the counterbalance study was designed to give a very low calorie diet. 
Individuals with type 2 diabetes, 30 of them were offered 700 calorie restricted diet a day over two months and then the food was gradually reintroduced and they went into a weight maintenance phase, followed up for six months. Nearly half of them achieved remission. Those who achieved remission, this uh, graph in black shows how their HbA1c and the fasting plasma glucose change, while the other half showed only a little response if at all. So VLCD seems promising, but if is it a, is it a pragmatic solution? Can we ask our patients to take just 700 kilocalories a day? It is as good as having just a one decent sized burger and that's it for the day. This is what was examined in the DIRECT trial, which was a pragmatic study done entirely in the UK, recruited recently diagnosed individuals with type 2 diabetes in the sense within six years, they were obese, and they were randomized to go through a very low calorie diet, followed by a gradual food reintroduction and then a weight maintenance. And this was compared against a standard diabetes care. They showed that at the end of one year, 45% were in diabetes remission. At two years, it came down, but still 35% were in remission. Greater the weight loss they achieved during the very low calorie diet phase, greater the chance of them achieving diabetes remission. These findings were replicated subsequently in the Diadem 1 study, which was done in Qatar, where they showed nearly 60% of individuals were in some form of remission at the end of one year. Do we have any data from Asia? This is a cohort study from Thailand where they studied 21 people, patients with type 2 diabetes, went through the same very low calorie diet, and at three months, 80% were in diabetes remission. This is data from Barbados from the Caribbean. Again, a similar intervention. Non-diabetic level glycemia was achieved in 60% of the individuals, and those who lost more than 10 kilos in weight were more likely to achieve remission. So VLCD seems to induce diabetes remission, and that is feasible in primary care setting because as I said, both diadem and direct were done in primary care setting, of course in a different healthcare setup compared to that of ours. There's another obvious problem that we need to acknowledge, and that is not all will respond. If you look at the data from counterbalance where they studied 30 individuals, let's look at this closely. Both the responders as well as non-responders lost weight to a same degree. The amount of pancreas, uh, liver fat they had at the end of the intervention was similar in both responders as well as non-responders. And it was pretty much the same when it comes to pancreatic fat. But what was remarkable is responders restored their first phase insulin secretion to a much higher degree than the non-responders. And this was replicated in the direct study. Weight loss, liver fat reduction, pancreatic fat reduction, all were similar in responders as well as non-responders. However, recovery of first phase of beta cell uh, insulin secretion was the key determinant or the key difference. Can we understand it based on this diagram? Now, in the face of metabolic stress, beta cells will de-differentiate. They are non-functional but can be recovered. If, and we know that to restore the first phase of insulin response, we need a reasonable number of beta cells to do that. So if the cells are in this recoverable stage, then there is a chance to reverse them back to functional stage. But if they have progressed to death, there is no chance of recurrence. So individuals who had enough number of dysfunctional cells which can be recovered were more likely to achieve remission despite of achieving the same level of weight loss, same fat reduction in liver and pancreas, if the cells are dead and gone, this is not going to be feasible. Higher the number of reversible dysfunctional beta cells, greater the chance of remission. The other obvious question is, or the problem is, relapse. Even with bariatric surgery, over years, a proportion of individuals who achieve remission will relapse. And this is closely related to the degree of body weight regained after the initial weight loss. So what is important there is to keep the metabolic stress away, prevent weight regain, and keep glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity away. This needs a lot of commitment from the patient himself, as well as his close family and surroundings, as well as from healthcare providers and healthcare systems perspective. Is there an easy way out? Can we 
induce redifferentiation of beta cells by pharmacological means. This is an area of extensive research. The entire transcriptomes of beta cells in their different stages of maturation have been mapped, and strategies have been developed to target and deliver a therapeutic agent to the dedifferentiated beta cells, but how to manipulate the transcriptome and how to reverse and regain the beta cell function and cause redifferentiation is still a question unanswered, but, probably, uh, but an area of intensive research. That brings me to the end of my presentation and let me summarize and say that beta cell dedifferentiation is central to the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Their redifferentiation is the key to achieve diabetes remission. This can be done by a significantly calorie restricted diet or by metabolic surgery. Its sustainability, of course, is still challenging. Whether pharmacotherapy can be developed to achieve this task for us remains a question to be answered in the coming years and decades. Going back to where we started, if at this point you can identify something wrong and something right about each of these statements, I think I have achieved my objective. Thank you very much for attentive listening. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Arsha, for that excellent presentation. I think we have time for questions. Arsha, it's an excellent lecture. Now, now, are we, now we are talking about this obese diabetics. Now, does this apply to the lean diabetics as well? Do we go for the weight reduction there as well? The, the, thank you for raising that question. So the question is whether this can be done in those who are not obese. If you look at the data on VLCD, all uh, participants, all studies recruited participants with a BMI of at least 27. So this has not been studied in those who are lean. That is actually one of the limitations because some of our patients might have already lost weight by the time they come to us because of diabetes itself. So there is no data to say that this will work in such individuals. Thank you, Hashi. That was very interesting. Um, any data from Sri Lanka? Have we tried something similar? Do you know whether it will work so for our population? As you said, it's a different setting. So. Yeah, yeah. so we actually do not have our own published data. But uh, as a fact, uh, I'm aware that some patients in some settings may be uh, put on this and uh, there are some uh, promising results coming out. There are several challenges that we have to appreciate when we try to apply this strategy to our setting. One is, as Sir raised out, it, ha it is limited to only those who are obese. Uh, the second question is, if we look at the participants in studies in other countries, on average, they weighed about 100 kilograms. And their average calorie requirements were in the range of 2,000, 2,100 a day. So coming to 800 from 2,100 is a significant reduction. But if we look at our built and our calorie requirement, in an average female, probably that's about 1,500. So if you try to achieve the same percentage reduction, that's going to be impractical. And we do not know whether bringing it down to 800 would still have the same effect. So there are a lot of unanswered questions and probably it's an area worthwhile to explore. Yeah, there are about three questions. Yes. Uh, coming to the Zoom chat box, can we apply moderate exercise to restore beta cell function by burning fats. Right. So moderate exercise does improve beta cell function. There is data to say that. But uh, I'm not exactly sure whether it is being asked in the context of a very low calorie diet. If that is the case, it is not advisable to start both very low calorie diet and exercise of any intensity together. Because once a calorie intake is restricted to 750, 800, it's difficult, very difficult for an individual to tolerate any exercise. Another problem of introducing exercise early is that that would lead to compensatory overeating, which is going to disrupt the very low calorie diet. That's why they say start with very low calorie diet, achieve a weight loss, then with the gradual reintroduction of food, start a gradual uh, escalating program of exercise. And again, uh, they're asking, what is the place for using empty calorie foods for restoring beta cell function? Right. Empty calorie food? Yes. What is the place for using empty calorie foods right. for restoring beta cell function? 
Right. So I honestly have not come across any data about this, any research uh, publications on this. Uh, but I suppose if it is used uh, to induce satiety without giving calorie, as long as the total calorie intake for the day is restricted to whatever the target, that should work. But actually, I'm not aware of any, any published data on that. The last question is, uh, when a diabetic patient gets remission, do we stop insulin therapy? So diabetes remission is defined as uh, a state of non-diabetic glycemia without the need for any anti-diabetic medication, which includes insulin. So there is, there is debate over the, diag uh, the diagnostic criteria as well. ADA, EASD proposed that they should be off treatment for six months to say that the patient is in remission, whereas most of these studies uh, labeled remission if they are in non-diabetic glycemia for two months. So the answer to that question is, yes, they should be off all glucose-lowering therapies to call one is in remission. Yes, sir. Each of uh, patients uh, in our setting are actually obese. Uh, diabetic patients, have you any idea? Like obese or overweight? Right. Where so uh, I'm not exactly sure about the type 2 diabetes, Sri Lankans, what percentage are uh, obese or overweight. But in general, I know the last prevalence data on diabetes from a national, relatively reasonable national wide came in Sri Lanka diabetes in cardiovascular study in 2006, and that was overall about 11%. But in some recent uh, small studies in Colombo, this is even about 25%. Obesity prevalence is also was in a similar range, about 10, 12% in at least in urban settings. But I'm not exactly sure among diabetic individuals how much, how many were obese. Okay. So in uh, Prasad. Some comments. Uh, uh, so actually, we had been practicing uh, this remission for a while and uh, quite a significant number of patients, particularly if they really commit themselves, uh, can remit. And uh, two uh, questions that you all raised, that is, uh, one thing is weight uh, loss. Sometimes, as Harsha said, some patients have already lost quite a lot of. So even maintenance of that lost weight sometimes might be sufficient for those people. And the other thing is definitely we need to do research because we need to identify the correct phenotype. Particularly some of these young, uh, so lean diabetic people might have these conditions like LADA and so on. So you need to really pick up the correct phenotype of type 2 to make it really, you know, uh, achievable and uh, correct. So, in other words, the answer to the question is now going to have a positive answer. And yes, in the future. Thank you very much, Harsha. That was a brilliant thank presentation. And thank you to both of the speakers. Uh, Harsha, I have a small certificate to present to you.